friend. Thank you. Let me add my welcome to Tom's, which was excellent. I'm just so happy that you had time to come here and be with us tonight because there's nobody I enjoy talking about more than Lydia Hamilton Smith. Let me just offer a couple of initial thoughts and disclaimers before we begin. Uh, my talk tonight, which is which I have uh, entitled Defining Lydia Hamilton Smith, uh, is based largely on this book, do a shameless plug right here, uh, An Uncommon Woman, and Tom's already given you the rest of the title. Um, the goal of my book was to capture the many dimensions of Mrs. Smith, and I think just from Tom's brief introduction, you, you recognize that uh, she had a lot of dimensions. Um, and the book has received, I'm happy to say, has received some very favorable reviews. Uh, one local review wasn't so favorable, but pretty much everybody else was. And and the, my favorite one so far is, uh, is from Barry Olmsted. Uh, he writes, uh, he did a review for Library Journal. And he says, among other things, Kelly seeks to do for Smith what Annette Gordon Reed did for the Hemings family in the Hemingses a month cello, which is to provide a biography of a figure given only glancing attention in the annals of history. That captures it. That's what I tried to do. And it took, uh, it took some work to get it all done. Um, the challenge was really that nobody took it upon themselves when, when, uh, she was uh, first gone from us to preserve her papers. You know, Thaddeus Stevens, there's somebody who transcribed all of his, oh, scratchily written documents. Uh, his handwriting was even worse than mine, I think. And uh, and they published a two volume uh, set of Thaddeus Stevens papers. There's, there's no two volume set of Lydia Hamilton Smith's papers. She did write, she wrote a lot of letters, but uh, nobody, I mean, as Tom suggested, a lot of people said, "Oh, she's just a house a housekeeper." You know, you know, preserve the papers of the housekeeper. I think, I hope, by the time I'm finished here tonight, you'll know that that was a mistake to to think that. Um, in fact, and it's not a, an accident that nobody preserved her memories. John Hope Franklin, the distinguished uh, black historian. Uh, had this to suggest about why people like Lydia Hamilton Smith and, and Thaddeus Stevens uh, have not been remembered. And he says that defenders of the lost cause, you're familiar with that, there's a lot of talk about that today, uh, intimidation and lynching of black voters, reprisals against white civil rights activists, revisionists of civil war and reconstruction history. <laughs> there's been a lot of that in Poor old Nikki Haley got caught up in that one recently. So, um, simple question. I mean, to me, I think it's a simple question, but apparently not Nikki. I don't mean to get political here. Um, a caution that I would I would offer you before we get going is that biography like the journalism that I did for so many years, is an invasive enterprise. You know, in, in the broadcast world, we'd take a microphone and get in people's faces when they had just suffered some horrible, some horrible event, like a mother who's lost her, her you know, 10-year-old child to a, in a gun accident, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I had that same, I, and I can tell you that there, maybe some don't, but the, the 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 folks I worked with, we would come away from those encounters feeling like we ought to go home and take a shower. I mean, we didn't have a lot of respect for ourselves doing that. Well, I, I began to feel that as I pushed closer and closer to Lydia Hamilton Smith, I thought, does she want me inside her front door? Does she does she want me standing outside Thaddeus Stevens' bedroom? Um, and the the worst thought that I had was. Would she like me if I met her? Uh, I think she would have. By, uh, by all accounts, she was a vivacious, pleasant person. So 
that 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 all of that said, I did, as Tom suggested, uh, break down the people who tried to define Lydia Hamilton Smith during her lifetime and later into three groups: the haters, those who say she was just a housekeeper, and those who say she was really a heroic woman in her time. Um, there's a subgroup who ignore her completely, even if they know about her. Uh, when they're and often this is people who are writing about Thaddeus Stevens, and I don't know. Some of you have already read the book. How in the world would you write a book about Thaddeus Stevens and not talk about this woman? Crazy. Um, and you know, it's interesting that the people who did remember uh, Thaddeus Stevens, Lydia Hamilton Smith, were the people who hated her the most when they were alive. And that brings us to these two. Characters. That's Thomas Dixon on the left, and D.W. Griffith, who became a quite famous and successful filmmaker back in the silent film days, uh, on the right. Both sons of the South, both white supremacists, and uh, Dixon was a Southern Baptist minister who really thought a lot of himself, and he came north. Uh, and ended up on the lecture circuit. And he was in St. Louis, Missouri one night and he had a little time on his hands. So he took in a stage performance of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And lo and behold, he walked out of that theater with tears streaming down his face. This white supremacist, because he, he wasn't sad. He wasn't identifying with the characters in Stowe's story. He was angry that she had perverted what he knew to be the real story of the South and what, what the Union had done to the South and ruined everything down there with the Civil War and Reconstruction. And he vowed to write books and he was going to set the record straight. So in short order, he wrote, oh, and, and he was, a, I tried to read these books. They're, they're terrible. He's not a good writer. So he, he tried to, he, uh, he ends up coming up with a book entitled uh, The Klansman, which is really a, a celebration of the Ku Klux Klan for driving Union soldiers and government officials out of the South after the Civil War, after Reconstruction, when Andrew Johnson basically shut down Reconstruction. Um, and they... they, they, they Dixon thought they were heroes. And, and so he writes the book and makes a ton of money. You would not believe how popular this man was in the North. I'm not talking about Southern cities necessarily. He was popular in the North. Had a lot of people who loved what he was doing. And after he'd made tons of money on the book, he made a play out of it. He thought that was pretty cool and made a whole bunch more money. And then he thought... You know, I, I just, I feel like I'm not reaching enough people. So he goes to talk to his friend, D.W. Griffith. They were both white supremacists, sons of the Confederacy. Their families helped start the Ku Klux Klan in, in their particular home state. And, and Griffith is only too happy to make a movie out of the Klansmen. And when they started putting it together, they needed some principal villains. Well, that's the character, Austin Stoneman and Lydia Brown, but that's that's really hardly masked. He chose Thaddeus Stevens and Lydia Hamilton Smith and proceeded to just hammer them into the ground and showed them as the worst kind of people. Um, and but what, what I think, oh, and also Lydia, who was a mixed race woman, but of somewhat fairer complexion. She wasn't white and she never tried to pass for white, but she was played by that woman right there, Mary Alden, a white actress. You see how she looks in blackface. Pretty disgusting. So um, in, in this story, Thaddeus Steve, this is this amazing. I won't go through all the plot twists, but um, eventually Thaddeus Stevens, Stoneman, comes to see the light when he's hanging around with these Southerners, 
finally sees the light that 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 white people should be running the South. Yeah, yeah, really. Lydia Hamilton Smith, on the other hand, because she represented the biggest threat that Thomas Dixon and D.W. Griffith could even imagine, which was she she was already the product of race mixing. And they were dedicated to preserving the purity of the white race. So, so whereas they uh, they they uh, let Stevens off the hook at the end of the story, Lydia was described as nothing but lascivious, hypersexual, animalistic mulatto woman. And you know, mulatto is a is a Spanish word for an animal, right? Which it's interesting that even the, the, the U.S. Census would classify people as mulatto in the 19th century. I don't know when they stopped doing it, but it's pretty disgusting. Um, and then, who used her sexual power to dominate the helpless Stevens, this white man, and, and allow black people to take over the South. There were other haters. George Drake was a newspaper editor, please change. There we go. George Drake was a newspaper editor from uh, Union Springs, Alabama, and he traveled all the way from Alabama to, to come here in Lancaster so he could eyeball these people, Thaddeus Stevens and Lydia Hamilton Smith. They were some of the most renowned people in the country in their time. Lydia was as well, uh, no matter what anybody locally would try to say. Um, and after he had seen them, I think he went to the house on South Queen Street. And uh, and after he'd been here, he decided, I think he wrote this before he even got home to Alabama. He said, in the city of Lancaster, PA, Thaddeus Stevens has for years lived in open adultery with a mulatto woman whom he seduced from her husband, a full-blood Negro. This mulatto manages his household, both in Lancaster and in Washington, receives and rejects his visitors at will, speaks of Mr. Stevens and herself as we, and in all things comports herself as if she enjoyed the rights of a lawful wife. She is a neat, tidy housekeeper, appears to be polite and well-trained, as Negroes generally are. I only mention the fact that Stevens is doing this that the ultra godly super sanctified saints of the African ascendancy may get the beam out of their own eye because Stevens had, had condemned uh, white plantation owners for, for forcing themselves on their enslaved women in the South. Um, beam out of their own eye before they gouge so mercilessly at the Modian hours. Other haters, imagine, now this is, this is our Lydia Hamilton Smith and we're, she, she had to deal with this, and so did Thaddeus Stevens. In the 19th century, Pennsylvania Democrats, you know, just reverse. You see letters in the paper all the time. People say, well, you know, it's the Democrats who are racist. And, you know, it's like, well, yeah, they were. But the Republican Party gave them room, so they, they just drifted over there. I'm sorry. Sorry, Tom, Tom's going to give me the hook. Um, anyway, uh, one Stevens biographer said, the whole democratic press of Pennsylvania was in the habit of assailing Mr. Stevens on account of his association with this woman and charged it was illicit. Stevens' mind was as crippled as his club foot, they said, and they made sneering allusions to his housekeeper as though no other white man employed Negro servants. And in 1970, that was still, that kind of thinking was still going around. James Jolly wrote, Stories persist that Stevens was informed directly or indirectly by a Negro mistress, and he jolly traces it back to Dixon and the Klansmen. Wow. And a lesser hater, and I'm not going to dwell on this too much. O.J. Dickey came to Lancaster, and I don't remember the exact year at the moment, but um, he shared a space in Stevens' law office uh, at one time. And uh, when Stevens died, oh, and so Stevens knew him pretty well, and Stevens even made him one of the executors of his estate. When Stevens died, and he died in Washington, uh, Lydia and the family arranged for 
you can see them there. It's not a great picture. That there aren't many great pictures of these guys. The Butler Zouaves, they were a special military unit that worked out of, out of Washington, D.C. And Lydia asked them, and they were black, and Lydia asked them to come stand honor guard for Stevens, who was allowed to lie in state in the rotunda of the Capitol. Tells you something about his status in his own time, uh, at least according to some people. Um, and when they were done in the Capitol, they, they put Stevens on the train, his casket on the train, and Lydia and the family asked the Zouaves to accompany him to Lancaster and to, to process through the street with the, with the casket uh, over to Shriner Cemetery where he would be buried. And uh, so they, they sent a telegram to O.J. Dickey, who was heading the funeral preparations. And he immediately wrote back, arrangements in Lancaster would admit of no military display of colored men at the funeral. This is a guy. I mean, these, these black soldiers were, were glad to do it because they really respected Thaddeus Stevens. And Thaddeus Stevens had done good things for them. Uh, over the years and was continuing to work for them to have the same rights as everybody else. So, but by the time they sent the, the telegram, uh, uh, the Zouaves were already on the train and they got here. Dickie let them get off the train and stay overnight and immediately put them back on the train in the morning. And they were they were chagrined at least to be treated in that fashion. Um, also, Mr. Dickey, uh, when Lydia and I'll get maybe into more of this in a moment, but when Lydia was trying to get back wages that Thaddeus Stevens dearly wanted her to have uh, after he died, Dickey not only tried to prevent her from getting those wages, but he pulled a trick to make sure that legally she couldn't get them. I mean, deceitful. If you if you read the book, it's all in there. Um, and it, I was, I read this stuff down in the basement of the, the county office building where they have the archives. And I think they thought I was going nuts because I just shaking my fist and I couldn't believe that she was treated like that. But she was. And then, uh, sad times, um, Stevens, two of his nephews came to live with them when she had first come to Lancaster to be his ostensibly housekeeper. Um, and, and he distinguished Thad Jr., the younger of the two nephews from Vermont, uh, distinguished himself a bit, I think, during the Civil War. And then afterwards, but... But all through that time, actually beginning, I think, in, in when he was in prep school over in Lidditz, he had an alcohol problem. And he came home from the Civil War. And, and uh, when, his, when his uncle died, he, instead of practicing law in Lancaster, which is what he had been doing, he took himself out to Stevens Ironworks, where I think nobody could see him get drunk. And every so often he'd show up in Lancaster and he'd say he, he'd want to be cleaned up. I mean, re really filthy. And um, and he would he would say, I want Mrs. Smith. Send for Mrs. Smith. She was in Washington, D.C. by this time running a boarding house. This was after Stevens died. And Dickey gets involved because uh, Thad Jr. went to Dickey and said, get Mrs. Smith. And and Dickey says, you know, remember that when she first came to Lancaster, Thaddeus Stevens told everybody in, in their circles, when you talk to her, this is a black woman, when you talk to her, you call her Mrs. Smith. You don't call her by her first name. She ain't Lydia to you. And, and Dickey, uh, when, when, he, when he sent for her, he would just refer to her as Smith. He said, uh, Smith should fix him up and send him off that night, meaning near Gettysburg. Uh, oh, yeah, we have some other 20th century haters. 
Woodrow Wilson, who said the Negroes were exalted. How am I doing on time? Uh, were exalted. The states were misgoverned and looted in their name until the whites, who were real citizens, got control again. He actually screened the birth of a nation at the White House. This horrific film celebrating the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and how did they manage to work that out? Well, turns out Thomas Dixon and Woodrow Wilson went to school together at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. So ugly birds of a feather stick together. Uh, another Columbia University historian would say, William Deming, uh, he promoted the view that black people were incapable of governing themselves and reconstruction had been a colossal error. Reversing reconstruction was reversion to the natural order. The same fact of racial inequality that slavery once encoded. The natural order is for black people to be enslaved. That's from this vantage point, it's just kind of hard to get in touch with that. Okay, so let's go to the next group. Just the housekeeper. You know, they, they didn't, didn't, you know, tear her down or anything, but but they also didn't, didn't want to give her a whole lot of credit for anything. Um, Judge Charles Landis, a noted jurist here in Lancaster County uh, back in the 19th century, uh, wrote a defense of Stevens and Smith, a very detailed defense. In fact, he, he says at the beginning of it, I've researched this, so don't you dare question anything I say in here. He, he did make a couple of mistakes, but anyway, he, he wanted to defend them against the scurrilous attacks that, that uh, Thomas Dixon, D.W. Griffith has said. And he talks about Lydia. He says she was a decent and respectable woman, kept herself quite within her station. Uh, she was warmly welcomed by Lancaster's leading families. And, you know, that same concept carried over to what the most recent Stevens biography that I am aware of, was by Dr. Bruce Levine and in 2022. And he said, Lydia came to work for Stevens as a housekeeper and the two developed a close friendship and working relationship. They were not intimate, he said. The idea, that idea that they were, came from those hoping to tarnish Stevens' image. There is no firm evidence to substantiate it. I beg to differ, I beg to differ. Um, there were those who wanted to defend her memory, but only so far. Uh, they, they insisted she would never have had a sexual relationship with Thaddeus Stevens because she was a devout Irish Catholic woman all her life. She'd never think of it. On her gravestone, and we're not sure who wrote this epitaph, but it says, among other things, I mean, the fact that she was married to Jacob Smith before she left him uh, in Harrisburg is in smaller font at the top. The big letters are reserved for this uh, expression. For many years, the trusted housekeeper of Honorable Thaddeus Stevens. Oh, yeah, I don't have to read all of these to you. Just the housekeeper, you yeah. have Thomas Frederick Woodley, another Stevens biographer. Um, and these guys, you know, they, they really, uh, that lost cause crowd really managed to to bury the memory of these people these people i mean in their day they were widely known stevens was probably during the civil war with the most powerful member of congress he he chaired the house ways and means committee it means he held the purse strings for the civil war and he really dearly wanted to put an end to slavery and win civil rights for the newly freed people, uh, and for all people of color, for that matter. That was Frederick Woodley, Stephen's biographer, said that Lydia was a woman of poise and personal dignity. She was unusually attractive. I mean, some of these guys, I think they really had a crush on her. They they just go on and on. And, and you know, what can I say? I was so pleased when, when uh, Penn State Press decided to put her on the cover. I mean, She's a looker, what can you say? Um, but she never traded on that, from what I could tell. Uh, she was unusually attractive, neat in appearance, well above average intelligence. She was very intelligent, didn't have a lot of formal education, but she was very intelligent. Uh, she was a small woman. She was light-complected, 
with almost Caucasian features, and Stevens grew more and more to rely on her. But she was just the housekeeper. Woodley talks about her packing all of Stevens' stuff when he goes off his unmatched shoes. People have focused on his, the fact that Thaddeus Stevens had a club foot. Some people explain his whole personality and the things that he did because he resented having this club foot. You know, he was lucky. His brother was born with two club feet. And, and I found, I found information that suggested that in his prime, when Stevens was younger, he was very athletic. And he's a good looking guy. Um, so he's gotten a bad rap by many people. Um, more about Lydia, she conducted his home quietly and efficiently and supervised the other servants. So she was a servant. She wasn't anything else. So I'll get back to that. Um, when we did entertain, she served the food and refreshments personally. Well, she really put herself out for the old Thaddeus. Um, where am I here? Am I am I one one behind? Yes. Here we go. Um, others, the Lancaster New Era, uh, after she died in her obituary, speaking to her generosity and her other abilities. She was a magnificent caterer. As the managing head of Stevens' household, she also came in contact with the great men of this country of whom she conversed intelligently and entertainingly. Just kind of a little, little music box there whenever people came to visit, you know, just turn Lydia on. She'd bounce around through the house and, and just, uh, you know, be, and she was pretty. So, you know, sure the, the guests didn't mind being around her. Uh, and she came in contact with the great men of this country whom she conversed intelligently. Judge Landis uh, would say at one point, Mrs. Smith was often at the houses of those gentlemen, that is the leading professionals of Lancaster, like Thomas Burroughs, the father of public education in, in Pennsylvania, Dr. Henry Carpenter, who was Stevens' physician, as well as Lydia's, and of others of the social, social you know, they moved in, in the, the best social circles, and she was on terms of intimacy with her families, so intimate that she left legacies to some of their children in her will. Her place, owing to Stevens having no female relatives in his home, at one of their parties, uh, you can't have the housekeeper uh, sitting at dinner with you, can you? So according to this, uh, at one time, when they, they needed a, a hostess for entertaining, this is according to uh, Judge Landis. I'm not sure if I totally agree with it, but um, because Stevens had no female relatives of his own, <laughs> uh, at least not formally, maybe, uh, at one of the parties, his friend and neighbor, Mrs. Susan Brinton, received for him. At another, it was the wife of Oliver J. Dickey who performed the same service. I hope she was nicer than he was. Um, okay, so enough of that. Let's get to what we need, really need to be saying about her. The Lancaster New Era would also say about her eventually that having become possessed of considerable means, which she did mostly through through real estate, but she also, she had a livery service when they were, then he, when he was in Congress and she was, she was living with him down there in Washington, D.C. I mean, the woman just never stopped coming up with ideas for things to do in business, which you know, and I know, women of any kind were not supposed to be doing in 19th century America. They were supposed to be putting on an apron, cooking food for the old man, and raising the kids. Well, she wasn't satisfied with that. Um, well, I keep getting behind here. I, forgive me. Uh, I'll go back. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, another indication of her being heroic. There's a story of O.C. Gilbert that I think some of you know. Randy Harris has done a lot of work on uh, digging out the O.C. Gilbert story. Gilbert was part of a group of, of fugitives who were on the Underground Railroad, and they got to Columbia, and somebody said, you need to go to th this house in Lancaster. It was on South Queen Street, and it's that Stevens' house. Well, Lydia was there, so... 
I mean, she increasingly became, she was the woman of the house. And so I think that uh, O.C. Gilbert, although he never mentioned her by name in anything that he wrote later, uh, he would have known that Lydia Hamilton Smith because she was there and she cared about all those people who were passing through Lancaster looking for freedom. Stevens insisted that she was Mrs. Smith, not just Lydia. Was that just respect? Was it something more? Um, uh, I'm quoting from my own book here. Taking her into his life as Mrs. Smith, not simply as Lydia the serving girl, and including her in every aspect of that life might have been as close as they could come publicly to telling the world how deeply involved they were. You know all the restrictions of 19th century America. She's black, he's white. They couldn't marry. You know, I mean, when she came, she left her husband in Harrisburg to come to Lancaster, but she didn't divorce him. Well, I'm, that sounds like a good Catholic woman, but eventually he died, so she could have married him, except nobody was really up for that at that point in time. Um, so, uh, and she endured, I mean, this is incredible to me. I mean, you would not believe the things that people said about these two people here in Lancaster, as well as from across the country. Uh, they just, Southerners especially just hated Stevens and they hated her too. And some of them thought that she she was the reason Stevens was pushing for the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments because she was black and she wanted her people to run the South. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, and but this goes on for years and years and years. And she never said a thing. And he never said a thing. I mean, this is, I cannot imagine keeping that in. I would have been all over somebody at some point uh, expressing my displeasure with their with their comments and their behavior. Um, well, okay, she did actually, she finally had, had had enough. In 1847, this is really only three years after she got here, um, the Lancaster Intelligencer was a Democrat-aligned newspaper, so they were particularly vitriolic towards Stevens and Smith. They just didn't have much time for abolition and, and uh, trying to put an end to slavery. So Lydia, and so they published all kinds of really ugly things. And Lydia finally, finally said, that's it. And and she and she she would actually tell when she got there, she'd tell them, my my white friends told me I should come call you out on this. And the newspaper editor, Henry Smith at the time, uh proceeded. He called his buddy over in the in the newsroom and they taunted her for the whole time that she was there and then wrote it up. And I think really enjoyed uh, showing people, can you believe this uppity black woman coming up in here and giving us grief? And she was so angry that she ended up, when, when he wouldn't say he would stop, she turned to him and said, I will, if you don't, next time you run something like that, I will cowhide the editor. Good for her. Good for her. He deserved it. Um, where am I here? Okay. Um, she was also, I think this is heroic. She had two boys. They were almost teenagers when she came to Lancaster. And she'd no sooner gotten here, she was 34 years old, when Stephen's brother died up in Vermont, leaving two sons orphaned. And so the family decided, uh, Stevens was from Vermont originally, the family decided, well, let's, let's send them down to Uncle, Uncle Thaddeus. And, uh, you know, he's a lawyer. He can, because, and he was already training lots of people to the law. Let's just have him train Allenson and Thad Jr. to the law. That would be neat. So suddenly Lydia finds herself with her two sons, William and Isaac, and these two guys from Vermont, uh, Allenson and Thad Jr. He's 34 years old. I don't know how much fun that would have been. Uh, but but she did it. And she related to them. She never, never stepped away from them. In fact, when they when they would get crosswise 
with Stevens sometimes, especially his nephews. Well, the other guys, her son's got on cross lines with Stevens too on occasion. But Lydia, they would end up writing to Lydia and saying, "Can you can you tell Uncle Thaddeus that you know I I don't think it's as bad as he thinks it is." Uh, and some very touching, touching letters that she writes to these people, these guys, four guys. Um, and they didn't end up doing so well either, but let's see. William got involved with a, a, a the daughter, a 14-year-old daughter of, a, of an ironworks employee over in Franklin County, uh, got her pregnant had ultimately two children to her, uh, it was a mess. And, and then he goes off to war and he died in the Battle of Chickamauga. And Lydia's dealing with this. Um, her older son, William, oh boy, get ready for this one. William got himself caught up in some kind of a love triangle right here in Lancaster. And he was engaged to be married to this one woman but he ends up having a child to another. Well, the first woman writes him a letter and says, I'm not marrying you, Jack. Um, I'm, that's terrible that you did that. So William takes a gun, shoots himself over the heart. Some people in the, in the newspaper and otherwise to this day say, no, it's just a, just a, a gun handling accident. Like fun. He, he had himself in a bind, like, and he just couldn't see any way to get out of it. Um, then the, the younger, younger boys, uh, Thad Jr., uh, he had an alcohol problem from very, very early on. And, and when Stevens wrote his will, he wanted, because Thad Jr. was the, the last of the line, he didn't have any other direct relatives to leave things to. If Thad Jr. had gotten dry, for three years running, he would have inherited Stevens' estate, which was probably millions of dollars in those days because he bought real estate land all over the place, thousands of acres. Ted couldn't do it. Ted couldn't do it. Really a sad. And, and Lydia, you know, I already told you, she would have to come home from Washington to clean this kid up. <laughs> He's old enough to know better, but he didn't. Um, so she was front and center as well. Oh, and her son, Isaac, Isaac, who was uh, uh, Judge Landis, liked to refer to him as, as little Isaac Smith. He was four feet, 11 inches tall. Um, and she had a terrible time with him because he got into drinking early on, like when he was, again, about 15, 16, 17. And... Uh, she would at various times she she would uh she would well she came home one time when when he was he was getting all messed up and she swore out an arrest warrant for him put him in jail for drunken disorderly and he did 30 days of hard labor i think you know she was progressive little tough love that's right a little tough love so uh Again, she was just really sharp, just a really sharp person. Um, and she was. Being here in Lancaster in those, that mid-19th century period, she was, uh, she was front and center for some of the most important events in American history. Um, you know, she, she was here for the, when the, the Fugitive Slave Act was passed in 1850, and that have a big impact on the elaborate underground railroad system that I know she was already supporting Stevens with here in Lancaster. Um, she was here when the Dred Scott decision was passed. Can you imagine how she felt about that? Do you know the Dred Scott decision? Yeah. The, the Roger B. Taney, the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, wrote this one, and he said basically... Black people will never be citizens of the United States, and I don't see that they have they have accruing to them any rights under the Constitution. I mean, 
she's living with one of the best lawyers in the country. I got a feeling they talked that one over. Anyway, uh, she faced challenges, dangers, delights, anguish, exhaustion. And it wasn't until pretty late in her life, after she had been running the boarding house in, in Washington for a while, that she wrote to a friend of hers and said, you know, sometimes I just get pretty tired, especially in the summer, keeping this, this boarding house going. That's the first time I found that she ever said anything about being tired. This woman was, she was beyond the, the Energizer Bunny. She was just, she really was was driven. I think partly because she was, she was born into pretty impoverished circumstances. Uh, and I think she was bound and determined to get ahead. Um, she was generous, almost to a fault. Uh, in her will, she left all kinds of money to people. She had a half-sister, Jane Cooper, who actually was sent off as a child to Baltimore, uh, was indentured to one of the wealthiest families in the city of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and she kept in touch with her, I do believe, because in her will, she left Jane a sizable amount of money. She also left money for Jane's children so they could get educated. Um, and that would have been, if they used it properly, she, they would have had a better education than she had, I'm sure. Um, she left money to Rhoda Goodrich. I don't know if you know the Goodrich family from York County. Uh, they were, I mean, one of their claims to fame is that, that one of the members of the Goodrich family was a, a pioneer in photography in this country, did some amazing things. But they got into the Underground Railroad, and they got so far into it that when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, they had to think about getting out of town, and some of them did, to just to survive. They they went north uh, to get out of it, out of here. Um, and there is actually a, a Goodrich Museum in York today. If you ever want to go and take a look at it, uh, she used the courts frequently to address problems that she had, personal, financial, and I think again, as with her investments in real estate. Uh, she was advised by Thaddeus Stevens. Why would he advise his housekeeper to, to help her build up an estate? Well, I'll tell you why. I'm, let, me, let me move down here. Um, okay, I'm going to run out of time. Lydia Hamilton Smith and Thaddeus Stevens, uh, it was said by uh, some observers that uh, she kept his house like a wife. Not like a housekeeper, like a wife. Uh, this is on the question of their relationship. Uh, she walked beside him for nearly 25 years. She got involved in that Underground Railroad stuff. Uh, and she, when he, he was engaged in, in, um, in pushing through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to, to guarantee the freedom and rights of these newly newly freed people of color from the South. Um, Stevens also experienced some very debilitating illness. Uh, one of them was a, a, lower, a problem with the lower tract. He would have these bouts of diarrhea. Sorry to be distasteful here, but um, from time to time that would lay him up for like, you know, weeks on end. And uh, he just couldn't do anything. And he needed... According to Dr. Carpenter, he needed 24-hour nursing care because these medications had to be administered in the right fashion or he would die. And who do you think took care of that? Lydia Hamilton Smith. Um, oh, well, don't get me started. Um, and, and I know that they talked uh, major issues of the time. Right after the Civil War started, when they had the first Battle of Bull Run and it didn't go well for the Union, he wrote a letter to her and said, we didn't do so well on this one. Um, but then he also ends up tell telling her, uh, I know I know what you're thinking. That is, by this time, Thaddeus Jr. and Allenson had already signed up for the war. And... Uh, the, the, you know, initially they could sign up for three months. They thought it was going to be over in three months. Um, and uh, 
and he um, and and he immediately reassured her. He said, "Thad Jr. and Allenson weren't in this battle, and I really expect them to come home soon, and I hope they do." Um, why would he tell the housekeeper that? Um, and, then, and then there's Jonathan Blanchard. He was an abolitionist minister and journalist who was traveling around, came to Gettysburg while Stevens was still practicing law there, and I think helped Stevens actually come to the, the, the deep, deep commitment that he had to racial equality uh, for the rest of his life. And Blanchard would end up, uh, he wrote about him afterwards, he ran, a, he had his own little newspaper, the Christian Sinisher, and he he idolized Thaddeus Stevens. He once told him, I think you have done more for the good of people here in this country uh, than anyone else of your time. I just admire you. I mean, he it's like he walked on water. Um, but he kept showing up because Stevens lived with Lydia. And, and he thought they were living in sin. Um, and he... He had other people who confirmed the same thing. Um, he, uh, Bishop Dan and Blanchard would actually go on to be to be uh, president of Wheaton College out in Illinois. And also at, a, at a, an Ohio church conference uh, after Stevens died, um, Bishop Daniel Payne was also there. And he was a, a man of color who Stevens had, had likely met in Gettysburg at the seminary there. And uh, and they were apparently sitting around talking about Thaddeus Stevens and what a great loss it was that he had died. And the bishop said, among other things, I guess, that uh, he lived with a colored woman as his wife without marrying her. Not a good thing. So it wasn't wasn't the racial thing, obviously. It was just the regular old thing. They were just shacking up. People didn't like it. Um, and, and so later, when Stevens is, doesn't have much longer to, to live on this mortal coil, Blanchard is in conversation with Stevens, and he asks him, who of all the great men of your time, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, who are you most like, do you think? And Stevens says, thinks about it, and he, he discounts all the other guys and tells, tells Blanchard why they were inferior or didn't measure up in his opinion. And he finally says, Richard M. Johnson. You know who Richard M. Johnson was? This is proof that being vice president doesn't get you much attention. He was he was the vice president under Martin Van Buren. I'd never heard of him until I read this. And and okay, now why did he pick that guy? Uh well. Richard M. Johnson in, had enslaved women, uh, and he took one of his enslaved women as a mistress. And he had two daughters with her, and he had the daughters introduced into fine society, respectable society. Um, and then she died. That that mistress died, but her sister owned her sister too. And so he tried to make her his mistress. And, and that, that sister ran off. She didn't want anything to do with him. Now, uh, Stevens said, this is the man he's most like? I mean, what in the world was he thinking? Well, he quickly said, yes, I love a woman of color. And I love her so much that I would never part with her. But I love a free woman of color who chose me and I chose her. And that makes all the difference. I didn't force myself on her in any way. All right. Um, so their relationship, guests often thought they were intimate when they came around. Um, a guy named William T. Hall, historian, biographer, would say that Stevens and Lydia were, and Mrs. Smith, were uh, first intimate in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. You know, she moved to Harrisburg with her husband and her two sons uh, around 1840. 
and then she would it was four years later that uh, the marriage had gone sour and, uh, and she left and that's that's kind of how they both would have looked about that time well, when she first came to Lancaster he didn't Anyway, um, so get, people thought Hall, Hall, unfortunately, didn't give us any details about how he knew that to be the case. Thank you, Mr. Hall. I don't know if he meant that. I don't even know why he meant that. Why would you say something like that if you don't have any evidence to support it? At any rate, uh, there was oh, apparently there were people who, because Lydia was working so hard to rise out of this impoverished beginning that she'd had. Uh, there were people who thought she was a bit avaricious of greedy. And when Stevens was talking to his friend and colleague, Simon Stevens, no relation, um, near, I mean, really near the end of his life, and Stevens had told Simon that he wanted to leave Lydia $10,000. Uh, as a, as a legacy, um, to to thank her for her care for him over all those years that they've been together, um, and 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 then that's when Simon says, uh, "What? But you know, some people say she's a little." And Stephen says, "Now you tell me what this means." This is Thaddeus Stevens, one of the most intelligent people ever to serve in Congress. No doubt. Um, he said to, to his friend, Simon Stevens, no matter what her love of money is, she has never neglected me or my household, whether we were in health or in sickness. Is that sounds awfully, awfully wedding vows to me, but I'll let you decide. Anyway. Uh, he tried to double the original $5,000 legacy, didn't get it done. Uh, they didn't get the, the will rewritten. So he told Simon Stevens, I really want her to have this. This is his, it's like his last real wish on earth is that Lydia be given in the end $10,000. So if you, if you can't add the 5,000, as a legacy, and we don't get the, that will signed, then you, Simon Stevens, make sure that that she gets paid good wages for the last six years of my life. And if you have, if you multiply that out in terms of what a good wage, monthly wage would have been in that time period, it comes out to about $5,000. So she would have gotten 10,000 altogether. Uh, but uh, O.J. Dickey pulled some stunts and she didn't get it. John Coyle was, uh, was a fellow Congrian with Lydia at uh, St. Mary's Irish Catholic Church in Lancaster. And uh, he said that Lydia told him that, uh, um, oh no, he, yes, she told him that Stevens had turned toward religion. He was accused of being a, just a pagan. And, 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 um, uh, and but toward the end of his life, she told Coyle that Lydia had had told him that she, he was turning around a little bit. Um, and then uh, Blanchard said uh, there's that he was had more talk of religion. And on uh, Stevens, get this, Lydia set this up. I know she did. You know there there are these wonderful stories of Stevens' deathbed, and and they, they just happened to have. Two black Catholic nuns and nurses tending to him. He really liked them, referred them to, to the white hospitals, wherever else they were. And um, so they're, they're there. And, uh, and as he's about to shuffle off the mortal coil, the nuns say, would you like us to baptize you? Now, I think Lydia engaged them in the first place. That's why they were there. And Stevens nods and says, sure, that's fine. <laughs> I did. It was, it's what she said later that made me think she set the whole thing up because when she was talking to somebody about it, like to Jonathan Blanchard, she said, I believe he is safe in heaven today. 
I think these two had a very special relationship. You don't have to believe me, but read the book before you decide. Um, which definition of Lydia Hamilton Smith fits best? I vote for the heroic. I think this woman endured some incredible struggles and challenges and just, I mean, I can't imagine being condemned like that for many, many years and just keeping on, keeping on and getting things done. So I vote for heroic. And that's really pretty much what I have to say. If if I have done my job right, right now, um, and you find yourselves tempted to applaud, I hope you'll be applauding at least as much for Lydia Hamilton Smith as you are for me. Thank you.